intentions, and we hope that he will give us, he will share with us some of his experiences in Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank also the organizers uh, for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure. It's my first time here also in the stand. I do hope that uh, this will not, uh, this is a short trip anyway, but I hope in the future I can come here more uh, for longer trips. Uh, I, I have been uh, working in the area of uh, uh, lifelong learning for quite some time. And uh, it's only in 2014 that uh, NUS set up a school of lifelong education. And um, I thought this session uh, would just articulate what are some of the ideas driving the need for lifelong education. Uh, all of us have heard about the fourth industrial revolution. It happens like every century, and the third and the fourth uh, industrial revolution happen actually closer, just based on 50 years apart. And what is the difference is that uh, in the current industrial revolution, there's the merging of the physical, digital, and the biological worlds. Um, you see a period of accelerated change. Uh, technology is everywhere and technology is accelerating uh, the change. You have tremendous amount of data. Uh, AI, you know, is taking over many jobs uh, and uh, automation seems to be the, the, the keyword nowadays for industry. Uh, and one, one important thing that uh, worries as a law is careers. Uh, the lifetime, or rather uh, the half-life of careers is getting shorter and shorter. So we see that average tenure in jobs uh, is now about 4.5 years to 5 years. Right? And uh, for most of us, uh, our graduates they enter the workforce at about 22, 24 years old. Uh, currently in Singapore, the retirement age is about 67. Our life expectancy is 86 for females, 82 for males. Uh, it's very likely that the retirement age will be pushed to 70 years old, perhaps even 75 years old. All right. So it is actually, you are going to work for 50 years, right? And uh, if the average tenure in this job is like four to five years, you're likely to change jobs 10 times at least. That's the current rate. But I suspect that the world will change even faster, all right? So key thing is that how can we ensure that our graduates remain adaptable? So, um, Klaus, uh, the founder of the World Economic Forum, felt that uh, governments actually has to come together with academia and industry to frame a solution to this uh, issue. And uh, the, the answer is really in light of education. Uh, in Singapore, uh, the government is actually very far-sighted. So in 2014, a national movement was started. Uh, this, this was the Skills Future Initiative. Uh, and the whole idea behind the Skills Future Initiative is this. Singapore is a very small country, 700 square kilometers. We have 5.5 million people. Uh, we have no resources except human resources. So it's always to our advantage, and we have always been doing that very well to optimize our human resources. Right? And uh, we invest tremendously on education. 
Our primary, secondary, and university education are amongst the best in the world. Uh, and that produced the requisite type of workforce for the country. And that also provides enough flexibility because our institutions are very responsive to changes. It helps that we are small so that we can change very quickly. Uh, for a long time, the government has been investing in pre-employment education. But now, looking at the quick, rapid changes in the environment, uh, it is actually very important to have post or rather uh, employment education. So you work for 50 years, I can tell you that no university, not even the best university in the world, can provide you with the skills and knowledge to last you for 50 years. So you really have to learn continually. And uh, if you look, uh, there has been rapid disruptions in the job market. Right? And the uh, World Economic Forum estimated that if you look at the current group of primary school kids in the world, right, by the time they go out and work, two-thirds of them will be in jobs that don't exist today. Right? It's frightening. If you don't know what sort of jobs these people are going into, how are you going to train them? Uh, it is a big, big question. All right? And uh, skills are very important now. And there are some new skills that cuts across. Right? Five years ago, uh, you would not have imagined that statistics would be very important. But statistics is important because of the huge amount of data. Right? The amount of data produced in the last five years exceeds all the data that was produced all right, before 2014. All right? That is the rate of the increase in data. And data is now a new resource. It's a, 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 it's from data, you can create value. So understanding how to deal with data is actually the key thing. So knowing data and understanding data becomes a prerequisite or requisite skill set. So they are actually evolving as new and uh, important technologies come forward. So at NUS, we, we thought that there are three uh, parts of uh, the curriculum that will be very important. That's the knowledge part. Uh, which always has been the traditional focus of university, right? And how you apply knowledge in the very uh, intellectual, intuitive, and uh, ingenious way, uh, that will be important. So critical thinking and analysis uh, will set you apart, right? And third would be the soft skills or the transferable skills that provides the adaptability as you move across uh, uh, jobs. Now, uh, NUS is uh, a fairly big university. Currently, we have 17 <coughs> schools and faculties uh, with 38,000 students. And uh, I think no, no university would uh, sort of uh, dispute with this, that we want our graduates to, be, to have this sort of attributes to be adaptable, agile, to be analytical, to be adept at interpersonal and cross-cultural communication, and to be creative, to be able to ask questions, to be able to challenge the status quo, to be innovative. Yeah, we want all this of our graduates. The question is, how do you do it? Right. So, uh, the way that I'm going to frame uh, my talk and some parts of it this afternoon when I talk about the important role of industry, all right, is to use the acronym AGEL, right? A for academic, G for global and experiential, I for industry, and uh, L for lifelong learning, and E for entrepreneurship. 
Um, so in order to prepare a student for a life of learning, we feel that universities have to change their paradigm. Right? From just providing enough for four years to actually building strong foundations to allow them to continue learning for life. Right? So we have adopted the T-shaped competency of the American system, but with the increasing complexity, right? we are actually now encouraging our students to do two T's or three T's. So the way that we describe it in Singapore, I'm a mathematician, two T's will be a pie. And uh, if you're in Singapore, three T's will be the MBS building in Singapore. <laughs> right? MBS building, there are three towers. Now, uh, uh, when you look at the vertical part of the T, one key part is that you want actually to be able to straddle you know, a host of disciplines. So one vertical should be in STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics and the other one preferably in humanities and social sciences. So cognitively, you engage both your right and left brain at the same time, and you train them, right? But key thing is also how do you integrate that, right? And the more the better, better. And we feel that the general education will be quite key, right? So in NUS, uh, we have been focusing on strengthening the general education. And what sets us apart in general education is that we get multidisciplinary teams, all right, to teach them. Right. Uh, increasingly, there's a need for students to be able to integrate skills across disciplines, all right? But all the time in universities, you teach the disciplines according to, I mean, physics will teach physics, mathematics will teach mathematics, right? Very seldom do you bring two or three together, even more seldom than you bring humanities and STEM together. But it is important that you illustrate how to integrate skills by teaching a very strong uh, uh, set of uh, core curriculum or general education modules. Let me move on to global. Global is something which uh, I, I think it's fairly easy. The idea is to expose your student outside your campus to other environments, academic and otherwise, elsewhere. Uh, Singapore is a small country. We, we, we have one airport, all right, actually two airports, but we don't have local flights. Every flight out of Singapore is an international flight, right? So, uh, uh, it is very natural for Singapore students to think of going somewhere else. So we do, uh, in my university, every year I would send 2,200 over students for semester exchange with one of our 300 partners from Asia to Europe and US. And uh, we also have uh, many uh, programs, very specialized programs with about 40 universities, about 80 programs with 40 universities. These are joint degrees, double degrees, or concurrent degrees. Now come to lifelong education. Uh, these are just estimates, right? And uh, the estimate is that as time progresses, People, workers, are going to need more and more continual education. And a hundred days is a lot. Right? But are we even close to ten days? Right? Our sense is that we are not even close to one tenth of this. Right? But if that's the need, right, then how do we actually ensure that our employees are getting that? So again, these three components, uh, lifelong learning is essential, like I've said earlier, no universities can provide you with the skills and knowledge to last you for 50 years, All right? And Singapore, we have this skills future movement. Uh, what we did last year 
was a very uh, bold uh, announcement by the university. We guarantee all our students a 20-year commitment. Right? You can't do your double T within four years. Never mind. You can do your double T within 20 years. You can do your triple T within 20 years. And you can do it. The moment you have graduated from NUS, we are not going to stop you from taking any course that is available under the continuing education framework. This ties in very well also with the Singapore's skills future in the sense that if you are a Singapore citizen or permanent resident, the government funds about 70% of the course fees if you are under 40 years old. And if you are over 40 years old, uh, the government funds 90% of the course fees. So it actually uh, is very aligned with the skills future framework. So last year, we launched by providing a set of 500 uh, continuing education courses for everyone, mostly our alumni. All right? We also opened it up to industry. Uh, in fact, uh, we started a buffet system for industry. So we partner with some big industries and um, we tell the industry that you, your staff, or your employees can have full access to our modules in the NUS, right? And you just have to pay a per rate basis for each employee. So for instance, uh, a few organizations would want all their uh, uh, workers to be upgraded to with a master's degree from NUS. And they pay a fixed rate to NUS. And they can send their students. And we have made our courses very flexible too. Now one important thing, uh, again, which is characteristic to the Singapore context, and I think it is very important, is that when you talk about lifelong education, the role of the industry is critical. Right? So Singapore has identified, relative to Singapore's uh, 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 economy, 23 sectors. Right? And in these 23 sectors, the Singapore government has worked with these 23 sectors on what are the possible all right, repercussions as a result of the rapid changes and what are the needed changes all right, with regards to the disruptions cutting across some industry. So the industry transformation map is really an articulation at least based on current knowledge of technologies that are available, uh, what each industry needs to do. And here, the universities and the polytechnics play a key role in providing the training courses. Uh, we are also partnering with industry, especially the big industry in each of these uh, sectors, uh, to create courses. And once you have an industry leader that co-designs with NUS or any of the universities, it gives a lot of credence to the courses, right? And therefore, other smaller companies would actually also subscribe to all these courses. So we are also, in a way, trying to reframe credentialing in the university. And uh, interestingly, when you allow lifelong education, you have many, many interesting examples, like this mother and daughter example of they doing the same class, right, in our nursing studies, right. Now, one thing that is quite fundamental here, and which we have not yet solved, all right, is the issue of change of mindset, right. It's not just change of mindset of the learners, it's change in mindset of the entire ecosystem, all right? Even the professors needs that change of mindset because teaching adult learners and teaching undergraduate learners are two totally different things altogether, 
Alright, and what's more, if you mix the adult learners with the undergraduate learners in some of the classes, right, the pedagogy has to be different, right? And professors has to be ready to change, learners have to be ready to change, society has to be ready to change, employers have to be ready to change. Alright, the change in mindset is critical. And I'll end with this note by Albert Einstein that uh, learning is so critical. Uh, once you stop learning, you start dying. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tan. As a spectator, I think you've raised a lot of interesting things, issues, um, and I'm sure there'll be um, some different perspective from Jonathan, since you mentioned data and automation and robotics. Back in Canada, um, we opened up what we call the first virtual reality laboratory, and we discovered a lot of things that we could not find in the traditional ways of learning. And so we had a phrase, data is gold, and I think that is again supported by what I'm hearing or what I've heard from Professor Tan. And you can see also there is emphasis on continuous learning and a whole lot of things we have to do to make sure that uh, that happens. Um, thank you again very much. So we move on to uh, Jonathan again, and I'm sure he will give us another provocative talk. Yesterday, he did, and today that will be a continuation. Um, he was introduced yesterday very well by uh, President Katsu. So I'll just mention a few highlights. Um, Dr. Jonathan was a base, base in China, this has been based in China since 1985, and has been instrumental in building McKenzie's China office. Um, he is co-chair of the Urban China Initiative, which is a joint venture of Tsinghua University and Mackenzie that aims to develop and implement solutions to China's urbanization challenges. Dr. Guzel has led numerous research efforts on global economic trends, including growth and productivity, urbanization, Energy and sustainability, this is one of the critical areas in today's discussions. And uh, finally, he has published five books about China. I think that is uh, special. I haven't seen anybody doing that before. So I'm sure you have a lot of knowledge on practices in China. So let's share and see what we have. Thank you very much and welcome to Thank you. Thank you very much, Fidelis, and uh, thank you also to Professor Tan for what was very insightful. And I, I, I stand here as a, not as a professional academic, obviously, more from a uh, business and uh, maybe perhaps a customer perspective uh, on uh, what, uh, what's, what's being expected increasingly uh, in the workplace and how the educational uh, challenge uh, is, uh, is therefore constructed. So I, I, I build a little bit on what was said yesterday. I try not to repeat much of it, but I will. I will sort of start with that, and then I have. I've talked to my colleagues who are more versed than I in education, and that hopefully present. They they've given me some ideas uh, to present in terms of what we see going on uh, around the world, uh, of which of course Singapore is a very leading example. And again, full marks there. Um, so. Let's start with a bit of, bit of a bigger picture. Um, this is not the first time this has happened. Uh, for thousands of years, and this is hundreds of years, <laughs> thousands of years, let's say hundreds of years, technology does create very, very large uh, shifts in employment and sectors. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've made a big transition from agriculture to industry, and as, as Dr. Tan said, we are now moving in from industry to post-industry or digital. Uh, and uh, hence the, the implications are there and the lessons are there uh, from previous work, uh, work transitions. 
And we think that's a good thing, first of all. So we really believe this, this is done for a purpose and it's done in order to sustain the growth and productivity and then ultimately redounds to the benefit of all. Um, but it is a transition and one does need to be ready for that. This is a transition which is interesting, as we said, because we don't necessarily know where it goes. Uh, when we look at new technologies, and here we give an example of personal computers uh, and how that created jobs in the United States, uh, most of those jobs, had people had no idea what they were. Um, then the vast number of, uh, first of all, so we think roughly over the 30 year period of uh, 19, uh, what are we looking at, 1970 to 2015, actually 45 years, that maybe 19 million jobs were created uh, in the U.S. economy, three and a half million jobs were destroyed, and net jobs created was about 15, uh, 16 million jobs, about 10% of the labor force. Of those 16 million jobs, 12 million of them uh, were in what uh, we call utilizers, the, the, the industries that now use the computers. Um, but they, so they didn't even have, they might have been doing something that was involved, a task that uh, could be regarded as, as computational, but it certainly wasn't as productive and it didn't deliver the same values. So, for example, uh, let's start from the, the direct jobs. And so the, certainly the computer industry created jobs uh, in computer software developers or computer scientists and it destroyed jobs amongst the people who made typewriters. And so, you know, that all in all is perhaps a bit of a wash. And so, so many jobs created, so many jobs destroyed. But they look indirectly. Uh, the people who are making the parts for the computers, they, they, they got jobs. Uh, the people who made, who assembled the computers, they got jobs. And okay, there were some jobs lost again in the indirect occupations related to the typewriters. But when we get into the jobs that this then enabled, sort of what were the things that happened because of the computers? We created software, we created a whole bunch of managerial roles, and against that, you know, only had maybe the typewriter repair people, so they, they lost jobs. But so here you start to see the pendulum swing towards the, the, the new industry. And then finally, you have the, the, the people who use this. So you have customer service representation, representatives, which really didn't exist before, and, uh, and, and then inventory management capability, which was, you know, if we think about what's happened in the outsourcing in the IT sector, it's all been enabled by the personal computer, and that has created a lot of jobs. Uh, and so that's, that's how we see this happening, is that it's a, it's a function certainly of direct replacement, but even more importantly, of the jobs that are created because of the jobs that are created. So it's the, it's the second order effects. In the same way that the automotive industry, for example, in the United States, created the hotel industry. So we didn't used to have roadside hotels because we didn't used to have roads and people didn't used to drive on them. Um, and so similarly speaking, when we have these new technologies that allow us to automate and to provide more value in everything from the supply chain to the factory energy, energy efficiency to the, uh, to the customer experience, we're going to have jobs that are created just on top of that. So, um, that means, as I said yesterday, a lot of people are going to switch their jobs. <laughs> They're going to move from occupational categories, one to the other. I just repeat this because I think it's the premise for lifelong learning, is that this transition is now not happening on a generational basis, but it's within a generation. So within a generation, we will have multiple occupational category transitions. Uh, and you see here the total numbers, and so we think overall, there'll be approximately anywhere between 100 and 375 million people transitioning their job within the next 15 years, 14 years now, uh, and which, result, which is, works back out to somewhere around 1% of the workforce every year. Uh, so that's, that's the challenge, and that's what's going to be happening. Um, this uh, transition will mean that it's not just, again, a job transition, it's a skill transition. So all these people are, not, are going to have to, many of them are going to have to move from skills that they had, such as collecting data, processing data, basic reading and writing, which you noted was one of those skills that is declining, um, to things that are much more managerial, uh, much more interactive, uh, and much more expertise-based. So it should be a mistake to say that that knowledge is unimportant. Knowledge is actually much more important, but it's actually the application of knowledge that's even 
more important. So simply having it but not being able to apply it doesn't do you any good. So workforce is looking, and the employers are looking for the applicability to apply your expertise. You do, know, do need to have it, but one needs to apply it too. So that's a big transition. Um, one last point. This, is, uh, this needs to happen now. Uh, it's not a theoretical concern. Um, this is what happens to the U.S. unemployment rate if we don't do this. Uh, essentially, this looks at reemployment within one year in different scenarios. So low reemployment means that 25% of the people who are supposed to find reemployment don't do that, and full meaning everybody does. Uh, and, uh, and the line there, of course, is the, uh, uh, is, is the range of unemployment scenarios. So essentially what we're saying is that if we don't get this right, if we can't get to you know, a rapid reemployment scenario, a rapid reskilling scenario, we will have unemployment in the United States right back where it was in the form of the global recession. Right back there, 2007, 2008. And we won't just have it for 2007, 2008. We'll have it for the decade of the 20s. So that's what's at stake here. And that's not just the United States. That's why the Gilles Jean are in the street. That's why we have the People's Party in Denmark. Uh, you know, people are rightfully concerned. They see the issues. They don't have a solution right now. So this is why this is an important issue. So what we see going on in terms of a future skills framework, and essentially this is, we think formal education is, is clearly a critical part of it. Um, but importantly, as, as importantly, non-formal education, learning that takes place outside the classroom, and informal education, uh, learning that's essentially acquired through social and professional interactions. And ultimately, this does lead for many people to a desire for lifelong credentials, which is a way essentially of marking your, marking your progress uh, and providing recognition to employers and to the marketplace that you have learned something. So by formal education, we include in-person, but also distance learning, and any type of a structured course. By non-formal, again, outside the institution, including online, may or may not be structured, can be accredited, may not be. Informal, meaning things that you learn by going to conferences such as this, uh, or online, or through, uh, through learning uh, from, from, from friends. Credentials ultimately are those certificates, digital badges, a digital CV, what you put on LinkedIn is actually your digital ID, uh, and, uh, and ways of putting all that together so that employers, and colleagues, peers, very importantly peers, uh, know who you are. So we all have a digital ID. Some of us manage it. And if you don't manage it, somebody else is managing it, in which case they're stealing your identity. Um, we encourage everybody to manage it that uh, this is better for you. So let's talk about some systems in which we see these things happening. And um, first of all, to mention, there is a global approach. UNESCO has put out a strategy document, which is quite helpful, I think, to refer to it, in terms of what, is, what we're trying to uh, encourage in terms of lifelong learning. We're trying to encourage people to, first of all, to think for themselves. And so there's a basic recognition that lifelong learning is about the individual, the individual's ability to think critically, to be resilient, to deal with changes, and you know, to, to meet perhaps broader social goals, including, of course, the SDGs, the peace and human rights. Um, but at its heart, it's about the individual. It's about enabling the individual to pursue multiple occupational category transitions over their lifetime. So how to do that? Well, first of all, policy. So there needs to be a policy, it needs to be institutionalized, it needs to be holistic, it should include the public, the private, the academic, the social, uh, and it should be evident in what it, it seeks to achieve. It should have metrics, it should have goals, it should, they should be transparent. Secondly, we'll need governance. And the governance is ultimately a question of subsidiarity. Decisions should be made at the levels which they're most effectively made at. They should not be centralized if they, can't, if they don't have to be. Uh, centralization is simply a, a way of aggregating a decision. So if you can push it down to the institution, to the unit, to the person, better to do that. And pilot, pilot everything. Pilot everything in cities, in towns, in villages. Create model locations. There's nothing like a physical place to ensure learning. Learning by oneself is a lonely business. Uh, there may be, there's, there's definitely advantages to doing it together. 
Thirdly, financing, there needs to be some. That this is if we don't invest in it, you get what you pay for, or you get what you do not pay for. Uh, and that is a, a shared responsibility, again, state, private sector, and individuals. Uh, we need to have some base competencies. If these things, there should, there should be priorities, and it depends on where you are, of course. Literacy would be a fundamental. And there are many different ideas for how that could be done. Individual learning accounts is one example. I think SkillsFuture, we mentioned that as the SkillsFuture credit. Uh, organizations in Singapore has piloted that. I mean, lots of examples. There, do need to, there needs to be serious thought to creating those. Fourthly, participation. Again, inclusivity. Again, of course, the UNESCO document, so it's, uh, it's about the world. Um, but it, every country has its different challenges in terms of who needs to be getting that access, particularly marginalized groups. And there needs to be a way for them to do that. So physical access is as important as digital access in those cases. And finally, quality. This is supposed to be, this is about mon monitoring and evaluation. It's usually the soft underbelly of most programs. The ability to do look back analysis and say, did it actually work? What is working? And how do I create performance accountability within the system so that there is a consequence for actions that are taken and investments that are made? So all of these things are part of that UNESCO strategy. Countries and cities do implement them differently. Um, here is uh, Denmark. Denmark is the entire educational system is basically oriented around lifelong learning. It's pretty well funded. Um, it has a 30% participation rate in Denmark amongst people aged 25 to 64 years. That's a fairly astound astounding number. <laughs> and it's a fairly high quality system. So how is that done? First of all, there are centers all around the country for all citizens, and so there's a dedicated research centers as well, but there's just more available centers. Um, there's a national political strategy um, these, uh, that's been in place for over a decade. Um, providers have to cooperate with centers uh, in order to achieve, receive state funds. Uh, it works with companies, works with academic institutions. Um, it's been culturally anchored you know, for hundreds of years. The, this concept of learning in Denmark has been established since 1830 uh, and is very broad based. Uh, and finally, it's very flexible. So courses are offered online, in the evening, in blocks, with lots of, uh, lots of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, more recently, the, uh, the country has uh, uh, started to focus on on the job training. Because low-skilled labor workers, they're noticing, were not participating in continuing education programs as much as the higher-skilled ones. So since then, there's been uh, much more subsidies. There's been increasing subsidies to employers for improving skills. Um, they must, in some cases, offer these continuing education programs. And with a specific focus on unemployed and individuals at risk for homelessness and joblessness. Likewise, there's an adult apprenticeship scheme. So essentially, we look at this as being, a, first of all, a success from system governance, that it is all social partners, employers, unions, the state, everybody together, and an evidence-based policy. And so focusing on those subsidies and those consultation approaches, and again, the center is playing a critical role in connecting the individuals with the, with the providers uh, as being the most effective mechanisms. So there's a one, one uh, country example. Um, I'll give you one guess as to which country this is. I think you can see the NUS t-shirt there. <laughs> so I would be far be it for me to repeat anything that Dr. Tan has been personally involved in driving this set, but simply saying SkillsFuture is a great example. There's a terrific number of internships. Uh, there's an earn and learn programs. There's skills, uh, it's a, uh, there's a different numbers here. So um, I could just say that the framework uh, is launched and uh, there are many more in the pipeline in terms of the industry collaborations, the industry transformation maps. Uh, and so again, Singapore prevents and presents another terrific example of how to upskill the citizens and harmonize the skills framework. Um, here is uh, the list on the skills future, I think, one of these uh, plans offerings. Hopefully it complements what uh, I'm going to look over here for a second, uh, what, what, what is said. Um, so that uh, gives you a sense for you know the scope and the scale of this, which is a you know a very comprehensive effort. Uh, one more, um, this uh, is New York. So it just goes to say that it doesn't only have to be countries; it can be cities as well. Uh, so within New York, you have uh, a something called the New York City Tech Talent Pipeline, 
where you know, the challenges out of reach jobs and inadequacy of training. So building a network of about 150 companies is all done by the city. We're uh, working with 16 different NYC colleges to identify five competencies and then creating a, a pipeline to essentially work together to uh, help those companies work with those colleges to attract those individuals and to train those individuals through the companies and the colleges. So, um, do's and don'ts. A couple of thoughts from, again, around the world. Um, things that work, um, make it transparent, make it easy to access. Um, so the, the, uh, whole is the French do a good job in terms of their holistic CPA account, sort of allows for, gives you an overview of everything so you can see everything. Um, make it independent of employment status, so it's continuing regardless of whether you're employed or unemployed. That's a, that's a big question. So like if you can only do this when you're employed, then that doesn't help you very much when you lose your job. Um, so having the ability to find a way to transition that equal inclusion independent of your current life situation, as they say, um, is important. It helps to be a planable. The employers need to be able to predict this. Uh, and so this is why a long-term continued accumulation of credits, the Austrians do a good job of this. Um, in some cases, this is another French example, thinking about you know, employers giving them some flexibility if people want to take or have to take an educational leave, that there's some flexibility in deciding the timing on that. Uh, and so the question of you know, how does the employer rightfully sort of plan for the fact that if that person needs to have more education is a, is a third important factor. It needs to be simple. Um, the Brits have done a very good job in terms of the ILA, you know, the labor agreements that sort of avoid those complex application systems, make it simple. Uh, and finally, it needs to be advertised. <laughs> so people have to know about this. So this is the Singapore, the, let's say 1.9 million visits in 2017. So pretty good. So the most important update is you. Uh, that is, uh, you know, I think just a public, uh, a public awareness campaign is, is, is really important as part of changing people's vision of what does it mean. So that, again, it's actual money. One actually has to spend that. What not to do, and this is always fun, um, the French have 150 to 400 hours as the budget. That's really not enough. <laughs> so uh, that one should really think about this as, again, as a, what scope creates the value. So there is, there is not a, it's not a token effort. So the number has to be significant, and maybe you don't have to commit to a lifetime of it, but at least an annual goal. That's that's probably something to think about. Right size of the number, avoid the complexity. So okay, variety issues in terms of how you offer them. Uh, integration is important. You can't just you know put it only on the partners or only on the employers. Um, one of the issues in terms of objective and effect, sort of like in this Austrian case, the cumulative the idea was to uh, create a credit system that you could uh, invest in over the lifetime of the employee, but you could also draw it down for cash. A lot of people took the cash. Uh, and so thinking about what actually is the thing that people want, sort of is it a credit, is it a cash, is it a retirement benefit? How does one plan for that and sort of adjust it if you need? Um, let's see, uh, distribution effects. If you optimize this, this is the British case, by focusing on the people who already have a high level of education, you're unlikely to meet, meet the needs of the people who have a low level of education. Uh, and so actually thinking through who the target is and sort of engaging the target, uh, the consultation process and developing these programs is at least as important as the program itself. Uh, and finally, there's also fraud and abuse, and so one simply needs to be able to manage the system so that the providers and the certificates and so forth are actually genuine and real. So, those are, in many ways, I would argue, par for the course, normal managerial challenges and, uh, and, and solutions are, exist for all of them. Uh, the need remains, and the need remains to meet that reskilling and that increasingly aggressive acceleration of reskilling that will uh, enable us to make this transition uh, and otherwise uh, avoid the, uh, the effects thereof. And uh, those are the prepared remarks.
this statement, technology drives the creation of jobs than destroys jobs. Um, I think that is very controversial. Um, again, going back to the role of um, robotics and human employment, that's a moral question. And I think we can discuss that sometime uh, during this uh, uh, discussion. Um, one of the other issues is that uh, um, we need for lifelong learning retrain, and that is quite important. And the big question is how do we achieve that? And I think you gave us some directions as to how that could be achieved. Um, you also mentioned decentralization in decision making in order to make these transitions possible and transparent, you know, uh, transparent, which is also very significant. Um, you ended up by giving us some example countries which are doing very well in these uh, transition periods for lifelong learning. That is Denmark and Singapore. And you also indicated in your talk that uh, if you're looking at the level of cities, New York City is one of the very good examples. So thank you very much, and we hope um, after all this, the discussions, uh, the audience will bring up more uh, issues, uh, which I think we can all discuss. So thank you again for the wonderful presentation. questions, 
of like extracting knowledge from everything around you, from even daily routine operations. And while doing my research, I have found three different stories which I think are excellent examples of what is life on Earth. And I wish to share them with you today. For the first story, let's imagine that we have a time machine which brings us back to 1935 England. Imagine that you are a raw construction worker who works shifts from 12 to 16 hours per day, who has no formal education, uh, and whose wife was lost in the car accident because the driver did not notice her because of the poor lights and poor visibility of the road signs. This individual's name was Percy Shaw, and once he was walking from his job to his house, and he noticed that the car had lamps lights deflect from the eyes of a cat. 99% of all of us will just ignore this fact. This is simple, this is routine. You go from your work to your home, you see that the lights reflect from the car. <laughs> but he was an inventor of the road science, effective road science. An invention which saved millions of lives and which are saving our lives today. So, this is a pure example of what is life and learning, in my opinion. It is the ability to look around, to have wide open eyes, and to extract knowledge from everything even from a routine operation. So the second story gives us back to 1945, when UK military government decided that their radar system is not efficient enough to detect their enemy's aircrafts. So they gave a task to a scientist, whose name was Percy Spencer, if I'm not mistaken, to devise a new radar system, which will work more efficiently. He started to make experiments, test different wavelengths, different frequencies of the, of the radar, and then he noticed that the chocolate bar on his desk melted. Again, a routine fact, which most of us will just ignore, melt the chocolate bar, that's not a big issue. But he, think, he thought, and now he is the inventor of the household appliance which all of us use. He invented microwave oven. And this is another example of what is called lifelong learning. This example of looking around you and extracting knowledge from everything. The third example which I would like to share with you has its roots in deep ancient Greece. Uh, you all know the oracle of the Delphi, who was deemed as the most important prophet. So once he got the question, who is the most smart person in Greece? And his answer was Socrates. When this news came to Socrates, he was shocked. He said, I cannot be the smartest person in Greece because I don't know anything. Then he decided to test the oral, the Delft Oracle, and he decided to travel through Greece to interview different individuals and to find the smartest person in Greece. He first went to Greece rulers and they asked him, he asked them, who is the smartest person in Greece? This ruler said, I am the smartest person in Greece because I oversee the politics of Greece, I oversee the economy of Greece. But in fact, Socrates noticed that this person is not intelligent enough. He does not know anything around the world. Then he went to art professionals, to poets, singers, dancers, and asked, who is the smartest person in Greece? And the answer was also, we are the smartest persons in Greece, because we know how to bring emotions to people's lives, we, we create beautiful scenes, we create beautiful dances, we create beautiful poems. But then he understood that they are also very, very they, they, they don't know anything. Then he went to the skilled craftsmen, some of them molded metal, some of them created household appliances, and he asked them, who is the smartest person in Greece? And the answer was also, I am the smartest person in Greece, because they thought that the, the, the way they are doing the, their appliances is very good. And after this, Socrates understood that the Delphi Oracle is, is, is right, because the smartest person in the world is the, the person who understands that he does not know anything, the person who always keeps asking questions, like Dr. Fidelis. Thank you very much.
now that we've had the three speakers' opinions, let me take the lead in asking for your opinions in something that has been in my head for quite a while. I've been going around, you know, some a few countries, and I give lectures. At the end of each lecture, you ask the students, do you have any questions? Always. Like now, the whole room is very quiet. Very quiet. And I'm asking, what is wrong? Is what is wrong with my presentation? What is wrong with my lecture? And from my experience, it comes down to what is the cultural environment in that society? In some societies, you have to respect the elder. You have to, the young has to respect the most the elder people. You, it's difficult to question the elder in some societies. And this drives down to the education center, where after a class, you ask, any questions, nobody wants to answer. Nobody wants to ask anything. And the question is, what is the role of culture in the, on the question of never stop asking? After the lectures, the students will run around and come to your table, yes, your presentation, yes, and start asking questions, please, please, please. Why do you need to ask the questions for the benefit of the whole class? The other side of it is the students are afraid to make mistakes. And because of that, they are reluctant to ask questions in the presence of their colleagues. And that is another important issue. Now we're talking about lifelong learning for graduates, young graduates, you know, students graduating, you know, future graduates. How is culture going to impact their development or their experiences in lifelong learning? What is the role of culture? In the comments, take it turns. <laughs> Never stop asking. Culture plays a role. Uh, culture is very important. And again, uh, uh, what you have described it's also uh, present in Singapore. Uh, Singapore, I think we uh, have a system uh, where classes are actually very well conducted by well-trained teachers. Uh, students are very obedient, uh, but uh, they are always quiet. Right? Uh, they do uh, ask questions if you make it you know, part of the assessment. They say, okay, I give you 20 marks for asking questions. Thank you, you jolly well. So, so some, some schools actually, uh, they do that in their classes. Everyone carries a tag and you put it in front uh, of you so that the professor will know your name. Uh, and uh, there's actually a TA uh, grading, you know, the sort of commands all questions that you ask. Uh, I, I feel that uh, we sometimes have to be proactive. Yes, if culture is a problem, uh, then let's try to change culture. All right. And you should start, of course, upstream, from primary school, you know, all the way up. Uh, and it is also interesting that uh, we send a lot of our students overseas, and uh, many go to US, uh, Europe, uh, and they like the more vibrant environment in these countries. Uh, they are comfortable in asking questions. Uh, they are comfortable in challenging uh, professors. But when they come back to the NUS system, they kept quiet again. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. Uh, so part of it, like what you said, all right, it's uh, you, you are afraid that you'll be embarrassed you're judged by your, your peers when you ask a silly question, 
right? And uh, I think that face issue, it's uh, a big issue uh, in Singapore. Now, uh, how do we actively change uh, the culture? Uh, at NUS, uh, we, we, we have this module which I made it compulsory for all students. Uh, the module is asking questions, right? Uh, and uh, what I did was I got uh, a mechanical engineering professor, I got a interior design professor, industrial design professor, I have a computing professor, I have a physics professor, I have a economics professor, and I have a philosophy professor. The seven of them, I brought them together as they helped me create a course on asking questions. All right. And asking questions is a mode of approach to knowledge. It's a mode of interrogating knowledge. And this is a very important way all right, of understanding and learning new things. Right. Uh, sometimes the key is really to ask the right question, not to find the answers. If you know the right question, the answers come out very nicely. Right. So it is a, a very important way. And I said that, can you all, in a short few weeks, illustrate how the approach of asking questions in your individual discipline? And then your, the poor philosopher, I said, you have to tie it all up because the philosopher is supposed to string everything together. Because whether you ask questions in mathematics or mechanical engineering or interior design, it comes under the same form, all right, of framework, all right, which students would have to understand. And I think we need to do more of this sort of things, uh, multidisciplinary, where you, you try to challenge the, the traditional pedagogy, right? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'll be happy uh, if my professors create a class where if you ask the right questions, you get marks for it, right? And maybe you don't even have to take exams. Uh, one of the best course that I did uh, when I was at Yale was by this professor. And that was the course that I worked the hardest. He came into class, he said, Here's a set of 20 problems, right? If you can solve, solve more than five problems, you get an A. And you don't have to attend my lecture. My lecture may help you with the solution of this problem, but may not. <laughs> so you don't have to attend my lecture, right? And, and that's how I think the whole class actually works extremely hard, right? And actually dutifully attend these lectures. So, um, different types of pedagogies uh, so that you can change or shape, reshape the culture. Thank you very much. That was uh, an insightful uh, response to my dilemma. <laughs> so, <laughs> should we move to uh, Jonathan to see what his views are? I think they will, they will just be that, just views. I don't think there is any. Yeah, tons of experience here, um, but uh, the, the this question of culture, I, I I somewhat struggle with it because if one takes the view that the talent is equally distributed on the planet, uh, and yet innovation occurs in clusters, um, there is an implication that institutions are responsible for that, and that the you know if it was just up to us all naturally, somehow you would see equal rates of innovation, but obviously we don't. So there is some merit in thinking through what it is about a cluster or about a place um, that allows for that natural talent to, to demonstrate itself in the, in the capacity to innovate. And uh, so that's, that's, for me, kind of related to this. And I do not believe there can be one magic answer for everybody. I think that it cannot be, in that sense, culture bound, that cultures should have are different because we define cultures as the way in which we relate to each other as old and young, as, as men and women, as, uh, as uh, rich and poor, uh, that yes, there are traditions, there are differences in how that interaction happens. And so that implies that you know, if, 
there is innovation again in multiple cultures, there should be different ways of expressing our, our talent and having this conversation uh, that are appropriate to, or that are culture specific and that, that work in one culture one way and another culture another way. So I, I somewhat wrestled with the idea that one should essentially fight the culture, so that there should be a way of thinking with the culture to say what is it that we need as a culture to develop and to innovate and to grow and that should be consonant with the values of the culture. So I observe tradition, I mean different models of interaction in the Middle East, in China, in, in, uh, in New York, and, and they are different, but I, I would hesitate to cut and paste <laughs> the New York experience uh, into, uh, into Shanghai even. I mean, there are some aspects which may well, may well fit, but ultimately the accountability, I think, has to be on the culture, and that the culture has to take responsibility for itself uh, to define the answer to your question. And if the culture does not see that as an uh, appropriate thing to do, well, then that's probably a short-lived culture. <laughs> that's a, in many ways, I feel this problem will solve itself. Uh, the, uh, but you know, for the cultures that are expecting to grow and to innovate, yes, they do need to think through what is it that enables people to ask questions. Because of course, asking questions is at the root of innovation. So if one does not question, one cannot innovate. Uh, and so, what is it that? How to make that a viewed as a positive thing? And if one needs to be direct and proactive, as, as Dr. Tan said, then I'm all in favor of that. Let us be direct and proactive. Let us make it crystal clear that this is a good thing for you as an individual and for us as a culture. Let us provide you the financial or um, the social incentives. As mentioned, peer groups is uh, powerful. And I think transparency and information about uh, this process and the importance of this is as powerful effect as any. My personal belief, is that particularly in academic sections, the reason that people don't ask questions is, as Dr. Tan said, that they don't know how to ask questions. Uh, nobody has actually told them. They haven't learned it. And there is a way of asking questions, and they're afraid, naturally enough, of the consequences of getting it wrong. Uh, and uh, given that you don't know what you're doing, the likelihood of getting it wrong is actually quite high, uh, which uh, is therefore you know, a rational response. It's like, well, you, know, you look around the room and you say, can People ask questions and the only hand raises to where can I go to the bathroom, then you know you, you really don't have a very educated population. <laughs> so that's, that I think would be a, a good first step. Uh, I work in, in a context where we have a global culture. Uh, we have people from every educational system in the world uh, working in the firm. Uh, and they are highly motivated to ask questions. Uh, they are highly motivated because A, they have a problem to solve. And I think that's a very clear important thing. And it's not an academic problem in the sense that it doesn't matter. It matters, and it has to be solved very quickly uh, in a matter of weeks. And so this compresses the time frame. The second thing that we have is a group learning environment uh, where we work in small teams. And so you have the luxury, in fact, you have the obligation to dissent or ask a question, uh, as we say. And then you can do that with more confidence, perhaps, because you realize that you're along with a couple other people equally don't know how to ask questions, but are equally motivated because they have to solve the problem, and so they will take that risk. And if that, and that risk is done in a relatively small setting, so you get a very quick reaction, and you get a quick and safe reaction in the sense that we all have the same incentive. The team is trying to solve the problem, and so helping one helps all. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the second sort of tool that we use. Uh, and then the third one is we give a lot of feedback. Uh, we don't give feedback after the course. Uh, we give feedback instantly. Uh, and we give feedback on a structured basis and every couple of weeks. And so every couple of weeks there will be a survey and it's two-way feedback. So did you do a good job of asking me the question? Did you do a good job of creating the environment where I can ask the question? Uh, and that's, uh, that's important, that everybody gets that sense of uh, uh, mutual accountability. And I think that also leads to a culture uh, where innovation is tolerated. And that's, we have to do this with people who are in their 20s and 30s and sometimes 40s and 50s. And I, we have to do it quite proactively and quite bluntly because we are fighting a, a legacy of we don't know what. Uh, people who have had the previous 20 to 40 years to essentially create a lot of 
issues and asking questions and innovation. Obviously, they're pretty good at doing some of it, because otherwise they wouldn't have gotten hired. Um, but uh, you know, still, I mean, there is a, a legacy of, of that we don't know what it is. So we have to be really clear about these mechanisms. Uh, so that's what we do for adult learning, I suppose, to help people ask those questions. Thank you very much. I was not expecting these expanded answers or responses. Uh, but I will say how to give Albert a chance to say what is. My comment will be quite quicker. Okay, thank you. part of this culture of not asking questions. And then why I was a part of the culture of asking questions. Because uh, when Nazarbayev University was established, I believe the culture of this university is quite unique for the country. And we students who just came from the high school we were not trained to ask questions. So this is very typical for what has happened in my average classroom. That the teacher asks, well, are there any questions? And we just stand up and go out of the room. But this culture was changed step by step by our teachers because they started to encourage asking questions, like what you said, they simulated by marks. Like Professor Tang says, they gave us marks for the questions. Later on, they established the policy of not laughing when we see the questions. So they made sure that whenever you ask a question, no matter how silly it is or how intelligent it is, it is treated as respectfully as any other question. And step by step, by instituting this, let's say, rules of the play in this university, I believe right now some of the professors, they will demand that their students stop asking questions because there are so many questions inside the classrooms. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was quite a good response. Um, now, I think we have to go to the pigeon hole questions uh, the audience have put forward. And I think one of the leading questions goes to Professor Tan, which is firstly, thank you everybody for your interesting presentations. What are the experiences of training faculty members in learning skills for preparing the generation Z? Uh, so this is something that we have thought a, a lot and actually tried with many things. Uh, our experience is that uh, trying to change uh, the more senior faculty would be very challenging, right? So what we do is that we hire a lot of junior faculty, right? So the younger people are actually more adaptable and more amenable to uh, using different pedagogies uh, when you teach people. Uh, the second thing is that uh, university is really about talents uh, and actually there's a group of talents that most universities do not quite remember to use them. It's the students themselves. Right? Uh, and students can be very innovative. It's just how you can tap on them. So we, we, there are two ways that we can tap on them. One is to actually get senior students to be TAs. All right, for lower level courses. I know that the practice in many departments is that you get a senior professor, a famous one, a very good teacher, uh, always to teach a level 1000 course. Right? Uh, and the problem is that the person who can teach very well at the level 1000, a very senior professor, will always teach in the same way. Right, it will not change it because if I can teach well, you know, and I can get good ratings, why change? Right, but you get a young one to teach it, then the young ones is actually more adventurous. So getting young ones to be more involved in teaching and getting the senior students to teach actually helps the senior students to reinforce the understanding of the subject. Uh, here it is, is that when you learn a subject and when you teach a subject, they are two very different things. When you learn enough to be able to teach, uh, that's where you really excel. Right? Now the second part that we uh, engage students is actually to try to work with students to co-design. Right? To co-design courses. So I have one professor uh, in computer science. Uh, who, who is actually, he, he, he wants to de de devise the, the, a fully online and fully effective 
right, uh, uh, high power cost. And uh, the way that he actually engages the students was that those people who have taken his course, so he is committed to teach the course of five years, all right, he trains, the, he picks up the best year one students and they become his tutors. Right, they become his tutors in their year two. And in year three, they get upgraded into those more senior tutors who can actually help him create problems, exercises, and other things. Now, because he is a computer scientist, uh, his students actually can also design systems. So he was actually trying to design a, an effective system. So he, he trains the student to design the system. And because these being students, they have learned the course through him, they actually have a better appreciation on how to do that. So these are two examples of how you can better engage your students to help you, all right, to change the way we teach. Um, there's another part that it is important is that how do we better engage the industry to change the way we teach? Right. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this afternoon. So we, we created three new programs. Uh, uh, these three new programs are in business analytics, in uh, 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 data science and analytics, and in cybersecurity. And in these three programs, uh, we make our students go through, within their four years, one and a half years of internship, all right, with the same company. The rationale is this, that these are areas that changes very fast, right? Professors may not actually be mindful of what are the real problems out there. So it is important to sensitize our students through their longer internship, all right, on what are the real problems out there. But uh, it has a secondary benefit to our professors because uh, the students may not be able to solve the problems out there. They will bring the problems back to our professors and then our professors will be sensitized to the problems. So the students now become a conduit between the industry and the professors. So that is again another way of sensitizing professors on what is new out there. Because say it, you know, you can say many times that, oh, we want our professors to be close to industry, but very often, uh, very few are actually that proactive to be always, you know, knowing what the industry uh, is doing. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent answer, response. I think we will take one more opinion board question. Um, no university can equip students with long life learning skills. Given that learning can happen outside the campus, is there a pathway to become employed and have higher ends without going to college? I think one minute each for each uh, participant here.
have the lifelong learning skill set in your mind, for example. That's very interesting. I think one of the issues I've been battling in my mind for these last few days is do we need PhDs? <laughs> <laughs> you just spoke into that. And what kind of PhDs do we need? Uh, now, uh, Jonathan, what, what is your mind? What are your thoughts? Uh, great comment. Uh, I, I, mean, I, uh, I think we have uh, too low expectations of, of learning. I think we should radically change this learning. I don't see why people, first of all, spend 12 years going to high schools and such. I mean, I think people should be going to college at age 15 or 16. Um, that's fully capable of doing so. And I don't see why we sort of treat children as pets to be raised in these controlled environments. So, um, and I, I, I may be generalizing from my own experience, but I think college education is very appropriate for people who are in their teenage years. Uh, 16, 17, 18, maybe even 19, sort of gives them a chance to experience a lot, sort of see a lot of different opportunities. Uh, and then I think they need to have a balance uh, of, uh, of education for uh, specialized purposes and whether or not it's, a, I think a PhD is essentially a union card. Um, and so if you want to teach later on, you should probably have one. <laughs> Um, but if you're if you're not trying to if you don't aim to be a professor then it's uh, it better have a very specific goal in mind. Uh, other and it, but there there's no reason why one should say it's either or. I mean it can be an and. So I started working when I was uh, when I was 18 and uh, I continued my higher education. I finished the PhD by the time I was 22 uh, and I was at McKinsey all the time uh, since then and onward. So. It, uh, there are many different people I know who go on to continuing education and higher education while working. I think Dr. Tan just uh, gave a good example. So um, I don't think this is an either or. I think it's an end. Um, and uh, I do think that the capacity to do both education and employment at the same time builds your skills and your resiliency uh, for a future in which you'll continue to have to do that. Um, there will be no retreat from the workplace. Neither will there should there be a retreat from education. I will simply learn how to do both. So walk and shoot gum at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Tan? Uh, if, I, if I may, uh, maybe your first statement uh, is a misunderstanding. Uh, what I think we said uh, is that uh, no universities can provide students with the skills and the knowledge the last for 50 years. I do believe that if universities try, and if the whole educational system try, you can foster right, lifelong learning in our uh, graduates. Now, um, uh, it, uh, my answer is similar to what Jonathan has said. I, 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 I think this thing about whether you do what you need in a college or you do it you know, while working, I think this boundary is going to be blurred, all right? And uh, I at least see two actually possible uh, disruptions. Uh, one is that, you know, the credentialing provided by universities is going to be challenged. And you're already seeing it, right? Google India provides a certificate uh, for six months uh, on a very specialized computing and uh, it charges 200 US dollars per month for nine months. If you finish your course in nine months, uh, if you pass, they guarantee you a job. Right? And they guarantee you a job, they refund half your fees. So, you know, that's one already examples of uh, 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 companies actually doing that. Uh, Alibaba is going to set up their own university and to train their ICT talents. Right? I'm sure many of the big companies have the capacity to do that. They can be very specific on the type of skill sets. So I think the credentialing uh, by universities is going to be challenged all right? more and more so as you move forward. And the uh, universities in the middle round they, they are the ones that will be threatened. Now, the other thing is that that is going to be a challenge is this. We pay fees, all right? We go to, most people go to university, all right? Not because
because they want to learn skills, knowledge. Basically, they want a career. All right? And uh, a degree for a long time has been a sort of a good guarantee of a career. But as you can see with the rapid changes, uh, that is no more so. All right? So that this, this framework of pain to go into university, all right, and then getting a degree uh, may change also, all right? You know that, let's say, in the legal fraternity, you take a case, uh, in some, some situations, you are paid if you win the case. If you don't win the case, you're not paid, all right? If you win the case, you probably get, you know, a, 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 a very handsome, sort of uh, 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 compensation. Likewise, there may be universities or institutions in future will guarantee you a job. Right? And it's already happening now. Huh? I can't remember the name of the company. Uh, it gives you free education. It, it gives you two choices. One is you pay fees up front, right? which they don't want it to be the default. And one is actually, if you earn 50000 or more, then you pay 17% of your 50000 or more for five years. Right? As your fees. And only if your salary is 50000 or more. All right? And then I think it is a very attractive framework all right, for institutions to provide. It's in a way that I jolly well make sure that I train you well so that you get a job, you know? But after that, your commitment is that you pay me after that. <laughs> I mean, so, so I think my universities have to be very mindful of what are the things that may come. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are about a few minutes uh, over time, and uh, probably that was intentional because we started late, 11 minutes. Um, I, I, I strongly believe um, the audience will agree with me that because our subject emphasis was never stop learning, the three able speakers have done very good justice to it. Yeah. So join me. <laughs> so that brings, to the, brings us to the end of this session, session four. And I think uh, my gentleman may have some announcements to make. Okay, dear participants, we now have one hour break for lunch. Uh, in your brochures, you can find the, the cafeteria, the Kundia Cafe, uh, in different blocks, you can see them. And uh, at 2 p.m., we will start in the orange hall where the opening session was held yesterday. And the uh, speakers, uh, please follow me. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.